there are like videos all the time of, of children screaming, a girl like with her eyes like completely blacked out, people with amputated limbs, like a father screaming and holding his daughter, his dead daughter. Night after night, Mariam Alwan looks at images like these from Gaza. She's Palestinian American, 21 years old, and a student at Columbia University in New York. Like, I feel like I'm living in an, in an alternate world, and, 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 and I, don't, I don't understand how people are, are, I don't know if they're seeing it and they're just not caring, or if they're not seeing it, and if it's my job to, like, tell people about it. What would you want people to know? The, the reality of what it's like for Palestinians. It's not a conflict, it's apartheid, and now it's genocide. Mariam is part of a group on her campus that's been organizing protests and trying to educate people about the situation in Gaza. But this activism comes at a price. Photos of me were posted online calling me a terrorist, and that did result in me losing my job. The suppression of Palestine advocacy and speech in the U.S. has a long history. But since October 7th, it's intensified, and university campuses are on the front lines. My name and face were posted on trucks that would circulate campus. Columbia is leading anti-Semite with my name and, you know, about 80 font, you know, mm -hmm. with a big photo and then a website. They're putting a target on my back. They're saying, here's your person, go get her. I think it's an exception to freedom of speech. Yeah. Yep. You're allowed to talk about anything except this one thing. Fault Lines investigates what the crackdown on Palestine advocacy means for academic freedom in the U.S. They think that if they attack us enough, then everyone else will be quiet, but they don't realize that we can't be silent and it's just gonna motivate people to rise up more. From the river to the sea. From the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Palestine will be free. This is one of many protests students at Columbia have organized since October 7th. They've been calling for an end to Israel's aggression in Gaza. And their university's divestment from companies that profit off the occupation of Palestine. Colombia has shown over and over again that it will do whatever it takes to maintain its financial stakes in Israeli apartheid. Mariam is a leader of Colombia's Students for Justice in Palestine, or SJP, which organizes closely with Jewish Voice for Peace. We just are trying to educate people about the ways in which the Palestinians are oppressed. We are really looking to the history of like the South African apartheid and, and how it was spearheaded by the youth on college campuses. On the 109th day of this unrelenting genocide, there are no longer functioning hospitals in Gaza. Divestment is the ultimate goal from weapons manufacturers and companies that profit off of um, illegal settlements and, and, and things that are, are just violating human rights. In November, the university suspended both groups. Campus administrators said they held an unauthorized event. It was later revealed that administrators had changed the policy about hosting campus events as protests supporting Gaza picked up steam. Administrators also alleged that the reason for the group's suspension was that the protest included threatening rhetoric and intimidation. When we met in person with the senior exec executive vice president, he said it was references to apartheid, genocide, and from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, could be seen as an incitement to violence against Israeli students. From the river to the sea is a call for equality because Israel is an apartheid state. We're not saying Jewish people shouldn't be there. We're saying just have equal rights. The language used to support Palestinian rights or critique Israeli policies has long been heavily scrutinized and smeared as anti-Semitic hate speech. No government should be held above criticism. There is a strategy right now in the United States by pro-Israel lobby groups to label any and all speech critical of Israel's actions as anti-Semitic. If you criticize Israel, you just have to point, that's automatically anti-Semitism. You can't even debate it. And anyone who tries to debate it is an anti-Semite. Our aim to educate the student body, or just to put a little bit of nuance in the conversation, is labeled as anti-Semitic is incredibly frustrating. These graduate students at Columbia are all studying international human rights policy. After the Hamas attack on October 7th, 
they were accused of anti-Semitism for a statement they released along with more than 20 other student groups. We sort of said, you know, the conditions in Gaza are terrible, like it's an open air prison. You know, we, some of us said things like, we've been warning against this for so long. While it mourned the loss of both Palestinian and Israeli life, the letter also said the responsibility for the war and casualties lies with the Israeli government. Similar statements by students at universities like Harvard provoked the anger of donors and politicians. I don't think the statement went over very well with the Zionists on campus and off campus. A few weeks later, they were doxxed. A pro-Israel group published their names in some of their photos online and on these trucks which circle campus. They called them Columbia's leading anti-Semites. I come from a first generation family and South Asian at that. So when I try not to stress my family out, I try not to, I try you know, you can't really explain to a Bengali mother what toxing really is. The group also created websites with students' full names. And all of us have very identical paragraphs here saying, yeah. we are part of a student group that signed a statement. Hannah is the leader of an organization that signed a hateful anti-Semitic statement. Your university must have done something to protect you here, right? Mm, you think so. They signed an anti-Semitic task, task force. force. Multiple task force. Yeah. Well, how does that help you, though? It doesn't. It doesn't. And it's back by not calling out that the trucks are falsely claiming that we're anti-Semites. By then creating anti-Semitism task force, it makes it seem like actually we are anti-Semites. Anti Hannah's Jewish. Before coming to Columbia, she worked for a Jewish organization, helping high school students identify the difference between anti-Semitism and critiques of Israel. So to have all of my, you know, young life's work so far be boiled down to three words is just really, I mean, it, it, I think it says a lot about where we are at the state of the world. The I don't think it's any stretch to say that we're in a McCarthy era moment here when it comes to speech suppression. Radhika Sainath is a senior attorney with Palestine Legal, a civil rights organization that monitors the suppression of Palestine activism. Much of their work has focused on college campuses. And since October 7th, their phone hasn't stopped ringing. We're seeing a record number of requests from students who have been facing severe anti-Palestinian hostile environments on their campus. And we know that students uh, are filing complaints and their university is doing nothing. Universities are happy to embrace diversity, different political opinions. But then when it's for Palestinian rights, you're suspended, you're investigated, you're shut down. Pro-Palestine and First Amendment advocates have a phrase for this. It's called the Palestine exception to free speech. Effectively, you're told you can research anything, you can do your PhD on anything, you can have a, a protest on the public square about anything except Palestine. And if you make it about Palestine, you're going to be accused of being anti-Semitic, of being um, irrationally anti-Israel, or of being supportive of terrorism. For several months, the university has acquiesced to this idea that the fear or discomfort or anger that some people might feel when they see a kafia or a Palestinian flag means that there's a threat that has to be suppressed. Like, did you catch up on like what happened with the drama on the call this morning? And there's all these things happening all the time. Like, I constantly have to check not only what's happening in Palestine, but like oh, did I get doxxed here? Is this professor who's harassing us, did he say something else? Like, it just feels like we're in fight or flight mode all the time, like completely hypervigilant. Have you been doing like your homework and stuff? Like 50% of it, like ish. We need to do like study sessions together. The thing is like, whenever we study together, we just end up talking about SJP and JPP. I feel guilty for even like trying to continue with my normal life as this is happening. I feel bad for thinking about myself and my friends. Because every time they attack us, it, it's a distraction from what's going on in Gaza. Mariam was supposed to graduate this year, but that's not happening anymore. Watching the atrocities in Gaza unfold and battling university administrators crack down on student actions has taken a toll. I lost like 20, at least 20 pounds last I checked. I think it's probably more now. I, I don't sleep at night. Um, I... I had to drop my classes last semester. I feel like I can't focus when my professors are speaking to me. Do you think Columbia cares? No, absolutely not. The message from the administration that I'm getting is that Palestinian life doesn't matter, and that includes my life.
One thing I learned is that Ivy League universities don't care about their students. No. What do they care about? The donors the money. and where the money comes from and how to mm. keep that going. Billionaire alumni and wealthy donors to some of the more prestigious schools in the country pulling back funds over the response to anti-Israel rallies on campus. After October 7th, many donors condemned the pro-Palestine demonstrations on campuses. U.S. media jumped on the story, dominating headlines even as Israel's attacks on Gaza escalated. Now, the real shame is I've given to Columbia probably about $50 million over many years, and I'm going to suspend my giving. How much did you donate to them? Um, I probably donated between like 7 and $8 million so far. Okay, so that's going to be a hit to them and their endowment. But university administrators didn't just feel the heat from donors. They were also getting it from Capitol Hill. Yes or no? Calling for the genocide of Jews does have... not constitute bullying and harassment? In December, the presidents of three prestigious universities, MIT, Harvard, and the University of Pennsylvania, were called to testify in a congressional hearing about anti-Semitism on college campuses. Yes no? It was one of several such hearings on the Hill after October 7th. I have not heard calling for the genocide for Jews on our campus. But you've heard chants for intifada. I've heard chants, which can be anti-Semitic depending on the context. The presidents of the universities did not question the underlying premise, which was completely incorrect. Students for Justice in Palestine and other students calling for an end to the genocide are not calling for genocide of Jews. I am asking specifically calling for the genocide of Jews, does that constitute bullying or harassment? It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. These university presidents, much like many people who operate in this space, they find themselves locked between their principles, we want to defend free speech, and we don't want to spend political capital on Israel-Palestine. It's a no-win thing for us. If we get it right on principle, we're going to get destroyed politically, including by donors. And if we get it wrong, free speech is going to be hurt. Anti-Semitic rhetoric, when it crosses into conduct. Claudine Gay was Harvard University's first black president. I will ask you one more time. After this hearing, she became its shortest serving president. Again, it depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. The answer is yes, and this is why you should resign. Less than a month after their testimonies, the presidents of Harvard and the University of Pennsylvania did resign. It was a gotcha hearing, and they got themselves got, and, and to all of our detriment. We're seeing the, the growing synergy between sort of an anti-woke movement on the right with what is an anti-free speech on Israel movement. All three of the people testifying please nobody. They basically played into the hands of members of Congress who wanted to use them to score political points against academia, and they failed to defend free speech. So we're seeing the playbook being written for how you would go into a university like Columbia or Harvard or Penn and say, you can't talk about race, you can't talk about gender. And what we're actually being faced with right now is a question of who has the right to control what people can learn and teach each other. This infringement on academic freedom has plagued professors like Dr. Lar Shihai well before October 7th. Horrifying. It's horrifying to think that you actually are in danger. How could one be in danger for being a scholar? In 2022, she was an assistant professor at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., where she trained future clinicians. So the diversity classes that I teach are really about structural oppression and the psychological impact of that and our responsibility as clinicians to think about that. That September, she hosted a campus event about mental health and brought a Palestinian scholar from Hebrew University in Jerusalem to speak. And so she walked us through our responsibilities and ethical duties as clinicians to be careful not to, let's say, unwittingly push the cause or the policies of any state. Her example was Israel. She's an Israeli citizen. She works in that context. Was that controversial at the time? Absolutely not. There were no questions or indications that that was received poorly. But during the following class, a few students said they felt uncomfortable by the talk and thought the speaker was anti-Semitic. I derailed my teaching for that day. The entire hour and a half 
was dedicated to truly hearing out these students, their concerns, the very realness of anti-Semitism. Did they say specifically what they were so upset by? Their critique was primarily any criticism of the state of Israel uh, is tantamount to anti-Semitism. And so therefore, this talk was an anti-Semitic talk. Three months later, a pro-Israel advocacy group called Stand With Us lodged a Title VI complaint, a discrimination claim filed with the Department of Education against a university. It accused Shihai of hate speech and discriminating against her Jewish and Israeli students. A copy of the complaint was released to a right-wing media outlet with everyone's name redacted except Shihai's. I woke up in the morning to a slew of hate mail, heinous, racist, sexist, anti-Arab hate mail. My address was released, uh, the place of course where I work. They flooded my employer's emails, uh, phone calls, threats of rape, forced deportation, harm towards my family, everything under the sun that you could imagine on every possible platform, everywhere. There is no place that is safe. The Title VI complaint kicked off a months-long investigation by George Washington University, which hired a private law firm to investigate Shihai. It found that many of the allegations were either inaccurate or taken out of context and misrepresented. But even though Shihai was cleared, the attacks continued. Post-October 7th, I had two events of mine actually be canceled. So in two weeks, I had a doxing truck in New York and a doxing truck then in DC again. You actually don't have to do very much for the racist, Islamophobic machine to run well-oiled. Release a name, let the rest do the work for itself. Title VI has been weaponized by pro-Israel lobby groups, and this has been going on for 10 years now. And it's to send a message to other people, other professors, who dare to criticize what Israel is doing, who dare to bring speakers who criticize what Israel is doing, that we will come after you and it won't stop. We reached out to stand with us about Dr. Shihai. They did not address her case, but in a statement said that they believe Israel is an important component of Jewish identity. The Title VI investigation accusing Shihai could take years to resolve. It has made me think that the United States is quickly becoming a place where it might be dangerous for academics to think freely and speak freely. In January, Shihai resigned from her position at George Washington University and is now teaching in the Middle East. But she's still getting hate mail. This one arrived a year after the attacks first started. The intent is to harm, is to railroad, is to intimidate, it's to silence, is to make people feel alone, is to make people feel like a pariah. This is not some low-key campaign that people wage. We looked into a number of organizations that have been trying to shut down Palestine advocacy for years, especially since BDS, the Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement, gained traction in the U.S. Among them is Canary Mission, a blacklisting website that targets people who are critical of Israel. Various investigative reports have exposed that Israeli intelligence has used it to keep people out of the country. And while little is known about who runs it, some of its donors are wealthy groups in the U.S. It's one of many such organizations doing this work. You, you have this giant ecosystem of organizations that who, who frame themselves as defending Jewish students and fighting anti-Semitism, and really all they do, or most of what they do, is target criticism of Israel. It's clear intention is this will follow you for the rest of your life and when you have a job opportunity people google and they will find it and it will haunt you it, it, all of this is about punishment and chilling effect we got a sense of this while reporting this story you know i've consistently stood and continue to stand on the side of justice and freedom and equality for everyone um, and somehow that was twisted uh, to make me out to be someone who, who was hateful or who was trying to incite hate. Several university students and staff we spoke with had experienced intimidation and harassment for their views on Palestine and didn't want to appear on camera. Some were afraid for their safety or facing professional consequences. I want to work in healthcare, and it's scary that my identity, something that I cannot even change, 
can affect that and can ruin that for me. Though some had already lost jobs. I had a, a job lined up for after graduation, um, and my employer told me that they would be rescinding uh, the offer that I already accepted uh, because of uh, my Palestine organizing, is because they basically told me that that I was doing had been interpreted as support for terrorism. As soon as you raise terrorism in this country, particularly post 9-11, I mean, you're really upping the ante, right? In this world right now, if you're on campus talking about ceasefire, you're being called both anti-Semitic and a supporter of terror. You know, there's a lot of talk about keeping safe our Jewish students who feel uncomfortable by advocacy on behalf of Palestine. And I have a great deal of sympathy for what those students are experiencing. But there hasn't been any talk about how this impacts our Jewish students who are committed to justice and peace in Palestine, or how it impacts our Palestinian students. I spoke about my family at a teach-in. I talked about how they were bombed and how we were trying to find their bodies under the rubble. And for doing that, I received a disciplinary notice from my university. So do you feel like you don't have the freedom to to simply just say stop the violence. Yeah, no, we, uh, there's no way that that would go well in that in my department. The basic question is: Do the lives of Palestinians matter? And one of the premises of this suppression is that they don't, and nobody should be talking about them, and no one has a right to talk about. Them. Columbia University did not respond to our requests for an interview. But in leaked audio, here's what the university's vice president, Gerald Rosberg, had to say about Palestine protests. I could imagine that somebody listening to that, that an Israeli student being told that their state is an apartheid state, a racist state committing genocide, seems to them like an incitement of violence against them. Meanwhile, Mariam and her classmates who are advocating for Palestinian rights continue to get hate mail and death threats. One of the emails was like, swinging from a rope, that's where Islamic trash belong. People are telling us to kill ourselves. They're, they're saying the same thing to my Jewish friends. They're calling them not real Jews. But there's one message that still haunts her. You should be out here shutting down these mother OK? End of story. It was something a Columbia employee told the college radio station at one of the protests. I'm an officer of administration. I'm Jewish, okay? I'm a Zionist, okay? I hope every one of these people die, okay? I didn't think, I haven't listened to it in a while. I didn't think um, that I would have like a reaction to it again. What is your reaction to it? I am like really scared. And, and people are like, oh, how are you? If you're scared, then just stop. But I can't because the whole point is to scare me to the point that I don't do this anymore. How long can you keep doing this? Until I, until my last breath, like I, and, and maybe it can have caught influence um, our government, I don't know. But at, at the very least, I think other Palestinians are seeing it and they're seeing that they're not alone. We're seeing the biggest protests um, for Palestine rights, for human rights, against genocide. It really, in my lifetime in the United States, the folks who want to kill, protest, and absolutely delegitimize, if not criminalize free speech on Israel-Palestine, see um, correctly that universities are their biggest challenge. Throughout history, students on US college campuses have been on the front lines for social change. And I think Israel and its staunchest allies recognize that. That is why they are engaging in an all-out war on U.S. college campuses. They are waiting for us to leave, mm -hmm. but rest assured, if it's not us, it'll be a new wave of students that come. Fire now! Fire now! Fire now! Fire now! 